we've been doing this series called Supernatural. Supernatural, what we've learned is that it is real and it's around us and it's crazy. And how in the world do we process all of this stuff that's going on? When I was in uh, probably fifth grade, I just moved to a new house and a new community. And I remember several times lying in bed and hearing creaking sounds in the hallway going up and down the stairway, light switches going on and off. And I don't know if somebody was just pulling my leg or if it was reality, you'd get up and say, hey, was, was somebody up last night? Like, what just happened? And always they would say, oh, no, no, nobody was up. No, I was in bed. No, I was sleeping. No, I didn't hear anything. But you would, you would hear this. Does anybody here have any like personal ghost stories? Anybody have any? So another question that kind of follows up with that, like how many of you would think that ghosts are real? Okay, so there's some of you. And so I want to kind of present a case to you today in which I would say that I believe that ghosts are real, but I also would say that I don't think they're what you may think they are. Okay, and so we're going to dive into that and take a little bit of a closer look here this morning. Uh, here's a bit of a recap. So if you've missed the last two weeks, there's a couple ways that you can, you can catch up on the Supernatural series. You can go to our website, connectionchristianchurch.com, go to our YouTube channel, and you can go back and watch those messages. But you can also take a picture of this slide, and I'm going to go through some things that kind of encompass the last two weeks. So number one, we learned that the supernatural is real. There was a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 of the servant of Elisha who was concerned because the enemy was attacking. And Elisha asked that his eyes would be open so that he could see the supernatural in that experience. And so he saw horses and chariots of fire. He saw the angels of God defending the town and defending the people. It's an amazing, amazing experience. We saw in Revelation chapter 12 how Satan was one of the angels. And he had this issue with pride. He thought that he was as good as, if not better than God. He wanted to rule over the people. And so he had a battle in heaven. And when he lost that battle, he took a third of the stars, it says. We would believe those to be other angels. He took those with him, and they became known as the demons. And then also we learned that, that Satan, and we could associate his demons there as well, he likes to, to masquerade or disguise himself as an angel of light. Light being good, right? So he would say that, that there's nothing to fear about me. Like, this is all good. You can, you can trust me. You can listen to me. But in reality, John chapter 10, it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's their objective. Demons, though they may pretend to be good, they may pretend to have your best interests at heart, are actually trying to manipulate you. And they will do so in the way that they, they twist Scripture. We saw that with Jesus as well in His temptation. Mark chapter 5, we see that, that demons can possess people. This man was actually possessed by a legion of demons, a lot of them. And demons not only can possess people, but they can also oppress people. The difference being is that oppression happens from the outside and it influences you, but possession is on the inside and it controls you. And you cannot be possessed, controlled by a demon, if you are possessed and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Like that is a huge, huge thing. And so we also understand that as Christians, we can absolutely be attacked by enemies on the outside. And they can try to, to get to us. And they can try to manipulate us. And they can try to gain some sort of foothold into our life. And so we need to make sure that we are prepared. And one of those ways that we get prepared, we saw in Ephesians chapter 6, that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against one another. But it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the high places, in the heavenly realms. And so there, there are some pieces of armor that are given, and we didn't elaborate on that, but we talked about two of them in particular. Number one is the belt of truth, right? The belt is the foundation garment. It holds things in place. And so the, the way that you are going to be able to stand against Satan is to make sure that you are anchored in the Word of God. 
And the last piece of armor, the only offensive one that we're told that we get, is the sword of the Spirit, the spoken Word of God. Now I would suggest to you that you and I are not going to be able to speak the Word of God unless we're anchored in the Word of God. That's how we take their stand against the devil's schemes. We're prepared because we've been students of the Word of God. And then we've got this awesome, awesome promise from John, one of the twelve disciples, in his letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, when he says, Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. It takes us right back to 2 Kings chapter 6, when that servant's eyes were open to the spiritual battle that was around him. And he saw that greater is God who is with us than the enemy that is in opposition to us. And you and I, for those of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who have entered into the waters of baptism professing publicly that we want to follow after God, we are promised in Scripture that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence indwelt in us and greater is He who is in us than He, Satan, and His demons that are in the world. So that's your supernatural recap of where we are today. And all of these messages just kind of fit together one after another. So we talked about Satan in the first week. We talked about demons, specifically demon possession last week. And this week we're talking about are ghosts real? This last week I was at a conference in Colorado with the Nexus church planters. And I was talking about some of the things that we've been studying and it was interesting because a couple of the guys kind of lent some information. One of them is kind of our, uh, our person that we talk to about Mid-India Church Partners, which is an organization that we support in India that does church planting there. And he said that he visited with some missionaries that were in Africa. I believe they're also in India, but in Africa, witch doctors are very prominent in communities. Right? They have their own rituals for healing and they have their own, their own seances and prayers and sacrifices and things like that, but it's all very demonic. Right? And, and there's a lot of deception involved because sometimes it's a reality that they're tapped into these spirits and at other times they are just simply going through motions and people believe that what these guys or ladies are doing are actually working. And so with that demon oppression going on in their communities, there was one story in particular that stood out to me where, where the demons were active there and they said to the people, or to I don't know how this communication broke down, but they said to the people, we have to leave because there's other people coming in and, and, and we just can't stay. A few day, days later, some missionaries arose, arrived at that community and began to present them with the word and the truth of God. And these demons could not stay in the presence of God. That's awesome. And also really weird. And then another friend of mine, he just planted a church in Winfield, Kansas. This is not Africa, right? Winfield, Kansas. Heart of America, right? And so in Winfield, Kansas, one of the most active churches, if you'll call that, is a very satanic church. The, the members don't hide this at all. You know, in the jewelry that they wear and the tattoos that are on their body. And he said serving as a crossing guard at the school, seeing some of these people, like you could just tell everything was, was a very heavy presence to them as they walked by. And I was like, dude, can you imagine what they're feeling when they walk by you? I bet they're feeling the Spirit of God, the same as you're feeling that, that oppressive spirit inside of them. Now this is really crazy that those, those people in that church, they began to, to pray in their own way that the, the activities of the churches on a Wednesday night would just cease in their community. That they would stop. That's when they were meeting. And they did. And the church didn't raise a fuss at all. They just kind of went away. And the occult was on the rise. And he and I kind of have the same idea. And I'm like, dude, you know what I would do? I can guarantee you what I would do. I'd have church on Wednesday night. I'd stick a stake in that thing. And I'd light it up for Christ. Right? Because I believe that greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. And I believe that, that God is for us and not against us. 
right? That there is nothing, neither height nor depth nor anything. Principalities, spirits of evil, nothing can stand against us and stand against the God that we serve. I believe that completely and totally. And so as we, we look at the story of ghosts, I want to I wanna give you a little bit of a reassurance. As soon as I saw this message coming up, and I've been given these messages different movie titles. So we talked about uh, how there's a devil inside last week, and before was Hellraiser and Satan, and this week is Ghostbusters because it's classic and it's awesome, right? So who are you going to call Ghostbusters? And we're going to bust some myths here this morning when it comes to ghosts. But I thought, how cool would it be because when we're not having a baptism, the, the, the tank actually sits empty. To put somebody in the tank with a white sheet and just have them kind of sit up at some point during the service. So, you're welcome. I, I, chose, I chose not to do that here this morning. But I, I still think it would be really kind of cool. When we think about ghosts, we often do think of the white sheets, right? Why does that happen? Well, believe it or not, the reason that the white sheets are tied to ghosts is because that they used to bury people in white linen cloths. And so if somebody was coming back from the dead, they would be wearing their grave clothes. Kind of a, think of like a mummy kind of thing. Only just different cultures, right? And how they would present this. But the kind of ghosts that we're talking about, they're not really directly talked about in Scripture. It says ghost, depending on the, the, the version, the translation you get into, it might say ghost a number of times, but it's usually referring to the Holy Ghost, meaning the Holy Spirit of God, or it's referring to somebody, you know, like, you know, they, they have died, they've, they've surrendered their life to the ghost, they've given up the ghost. But there's another term that's used, it's called a familiar spirit, right? A, a spirit that you, you recognize that you can connect with. So this familiar spirit can kind of pull you in and entice you a little bit. Now here are some, I think, really cool, really weird ghost stories in the Bible. So the first one we're going to go to is Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, page 842 So Jesus has just been with his disciples. They went to a faraway place. All the people found out where they were. They all came to hear Jesus talk. He did this whole feeding of the 5,000 people, right, with five loaves and two fish. Pretty miraculous. It was a long day. Disciples wanted to leave. Jesus sent them off in their boat across the Sea of Galilee, but he stayed behind to pray. And it says in verse 48, And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. That enough? We'll probably wig somebody out. Right? And that alone would be a really awesome gift to have. Like, watch this, guys. But he meant to pass by them. I don't know how Jesus meant to and didn't. But he, it says that he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea... They thought that he was a, did you catch that word in there if you got your Bibles open? They thought that he was a ghost. And they cried out, for they all saw him and they were terrified. I'm more amazed by what's not in that passage. Well, let me tell you what I don't see in that passage. I don't see Jesus walking up to the boat and going, guys, get it together here. There's no such thing as ghosts. Like, come on, back to earth here for a moment. Let's just move on. Right? It's me. Get over it. Jesus doesn't say that. And these 12 guys have been following Jesus. They've been seeing Him do the miraculous. And if there's anybody that should get this idea that there's no such thing as ghosts, it ought to be the 12. But they are terrified at what they see. Okay? Kind of crazy. Matthew chapter 27. A lot of stories about the resurrection of Jesus, right? We do this every Easter. We talk about, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, page 835. Verse 52. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. 
And coming out of the tombs after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Does that sound like a ghost story to you? So Jesus died. The graves were opened up. And some of the saints came out of their graves and into Jerusalem. That's whack. It's crazy to think that that kind of stuff happens. So what is the reality? Like, are, are ghosts real? Or are they not real? Because obviously there's some passages in Scripture that kind of make us wonder, like, what is really going on in this situation? Can people really come back from the dead? There's another one in 1 Samuel chapter 28, page 250. And we're going to get into this one a little bit more next week when we talk about witches. But it says in... 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 11. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up before you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. Samuel was a priest. Right? He is the one that anointed Saul and later David as well, but he has died. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Okay, now remember, this, is, this lady is a medium. She interacts with the spirit world on behalf of other people. And when she saw Samuel, she was terrified. Now was this a trick? Was this a deception? Or was this reality? Scholars disagree there. But it says that when she saw him, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? Because he came in all dressed up because he had just told them that they're not supposed to have mediums in the land. But yet, whenever he did the wrong things and God removed his presence from him, he went to the medium to find the answer he was looking for. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. He later goes on and has a conversation with Samuel. Crazy, right? And here's a couple of theories. I, I would suggest to you that I believe that sometimes God takes a special opportunity to do what's normally not done. Right, raising up the saints after the death of Christ to appear to the, the people in town so that they would know that through the death of Christ there is new life that's afforded. Okay, And perhaps God used this situation to let Saul know that I really am in control and you really have disobeyed me and you should not be doing this. But I also believe that there is some possible deception at play as well. Now the kind of deception I think is this, that sometimes those who are or mediums can speak in broad generalities. I see an old man coming with a robe. I'm sure that never happened in that land. Right? How many of you know somebody who's old? Right? How many of you know somebody who wears a t-shirt? Right? Sometimes broad generalities that allow our mind, our imagination to grab a hold of. Sometimes, uh, in, in these kind of situations, you get this idea, one of the words they used to describe a medium was like a vessel, and it, it's used to des describe ventriloquists now, so they could actually throw their voice. And so you would think that you're actually speaking to the Spirit, but in reality, they are misleading you by throwing their voice. Is that possible? Sure. I think both are possible in this situation, and I would definitely tell you that that there's a lot of disagreement in this text, but it is yet another ghost story that we see in Scripture. What I want to give you, though, is a word of advice in regards to this consulting the spirits of the dead, the ghosts. And it comes from Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 8, verse 19, it's on the screen for us. It says this, And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, this is that whole ventriloquist kind of peace when they chirp and mutter? Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Okay, absorb that for a moment. That, 
that whenever you and I seek out mediums to visit with ghosts of dead people, God is actually saying through His prophet, don't do that. Right? Come to me, not dead people. Now in this particular passage, it doesn't give you really a like, is it possible or is it not possible? Right? But we're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. So when it comes to ghosts, let's hit a couple of passages that kind of talk about this disembodied spirit kind of concept. Job chapter 7, page 421. Job chapter 7, starting in verse 9. It says here, as the clouds, cloud fades and vanishes... So he goes down to Sheol, does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. So when somebody dies, they go to their destination of death. Sheol being a pit of darkness. Right? When you die, you, you go and you do not come back. Not to your house or any other place anymore. So I know a big thing with Halloween is haunted houses, right? You go to a house, you want to you know, see if you can sleep through the night because this is the real haunted house. Or maybe you see the stories about them on TV. Uh, maybe you just go to one of the haunted houses that are just you know, kind of a fun amusement attraction, right? Just to, to go through so somebody can take a chainsaw without a chain on it and chase you around and you can scream like a little girl. Right? There are all sorts of this. But what I want to share with you is that, that for people who die, here's the paraphrase, they're dead. Right? They're not coming back. They're not haunting anything. They're dead. They're not coming back anymore. Psalm 146, page 525. Excuse me, 146. Verses 3-4. through four. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Okay, this is talking specifically about a prince, but any son of man, because the son of man, any of us, cannot provide salvation for anybody. You see, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. On that very day, those who die, any plans that they have, they die with them. Right? So it doesn't matter that somebody's got some unfinished business. It doesn't matter that if you're Patrick Swayze and you have some unrequainted love. Right? You're not coming back and you're definitely not hopping on the potter's wheel. Right? You can forget about that. There are some great stories out there, some great some great ideas that kind of go with this whole mystic ghost thing. But the reality is that ghosts are not, at least most of the time, dead people. Right? God has to make a special exemption for something like that to happen, like we read in a couple of spots. But in reality, that when people die, they die. And let me also clear up something else for you. I believe that the spiritual realm is very real. And I believe that when you and I die, we do not grow a pair of wings and become angels, right? There's this huge misconception that when, when a believer dies, that they, they get their wings, right? And they become servants of God. That is found absolutely nowhere in Scripture, right? No more so than when you die and you're evil, you get to become a demon and haunt people. It's just not there. You're not going to find that in Scripture. But what you will find is that ghosts are real and they're not people, and I believe that they are one of two things that you and I wrestle with. The first thing is nothing supernatural at all. Sometimes you and I get an active imagination and we think things that aren't real. Right? We, we hear sounds, we see things, and, and our imagination takes us on a trip. And we begin to think things. Another thing that I believe happens is that the demons take on the image of familiar spirits. 
And let me show you why I believe that. One of Satan's greatest tools is deception. We talked about that in 2 Corinthians. Right? That he masquerades himself as an angel of light. What better way to masquerade yourself as in the image of somebody that someone else trusts? And so then we begin to search out. We look for those those people that we think are going to guide us along the way. And whether that's a real person or that's the image of a person that's been taken by a demon, we have to decide. But I believe that more often than not, this is a demon trying to manipulate us by taking on the appearance of a familiar spirit. And they deceive us in a lot of ways, right? Uh, we're, we're harmless. Like, like we're good. You can, you can still worship God. You can still do the things of God. But then you can also kind of do this on the side. You can still consult mediums on the side. You can still chase after fortunes on the side. You can still chase ghosts on the side. But that's a deception. And they're so good at it. Right? Another way that, that these demons deceive us is that they, they take the text that you and I are, are drawn to and they twist it just the way they did with Jesus in Matthew 4. When he's, he's fasting and he's attacked by, by Satan, he's tempted. And Satan just, he knows what makes him tick and he, he begins to work those things. He begins to pull those strings and then he throws scripture in it, but he's completely taken it out of context. He's completely twisted it to fit what he wants to get accomplished. And the only way that you and I can stand against that is to actually know the word of God and to be living the word of God, right? It goes right back to what we talked about in Ephesians chapter six, that we have to have that belt of truth. We have to be anchored in the word of God and we have to know it, live it, breathe it. And we yield the spirit of the word of God. That's our sword. We know that with all of this deception, whether we talked about Satan week one, demon possession week two, or now ghosts week three, that the purpose of these evil spirits is to steal, kill, and destroy. Doesn't matter how good they look, how tempting they might be, or how much scripture they quote to you. They have an objective, and that's harm. Right? They are a thief, and they're set on destruction. So here, I believe, are some things that you and I can do to take our stand against Satan. So I'm going to take you actually back to the book of Psalms. In Psalm chapter 91, verse 9. Psalm 91, verse 9, page 497. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge... No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Okay, so this is before Jesus has taken on flesh and made His dwelling among man. Right? This is before His death, burial, and resurrection. This is before the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is this, if we seek refuge in God and in the ways of God, that He's going to protect us through His angels. So if we want to stand up against demonic oppression or possession or stories of ghosts or the attack of Satan, we have to be in the presence and the authority of God. That's carried over in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. So Jesus has died and He's ascended back to heaven. And His church is left there behind and the disciples are, are beginning to speak out on behalf of Jesus. And so all of these people are, are there, a huge crowd drawn in. And Peter begins to tell them exactly what happened. You see guys, this Jesus who you crucified is the Son of God. And the grave couldn't stop Him. And one day He's coming back. And it says they were cut to the heart. They wanted to know what to do about this. To which he replied, repent and be baptized every one of you. Repent. Stop doing the things that are wrong. Stop living in opposition to the word of God. 
and be baptized, right? Be immersed completely and totally into the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. So you're going to die to yourself under the waters of baptism and you're going to be raised to a new life. One of the dangers that comes with this, guys, is that we, we do that. We say, oh, I was so wrong. And then we surrender our life through baptism and we do nothing more than come up a wet sinner because we haven't gotten into the Word of God and we haven't began to live the Word of God. And it doesn't matter how many times you've been baptized. It doesn't matter where you got baptized. It doesn't matter what kind of Christian jewelry or bumper sticker or tattoo you have. How many times you come to church, that's not going to save you. Right? You're saved only through Jesus Christ. He is the only one that has the power over sin and death. The only one. And He's given it free to us. But He's also expecting us to walk in obedience to Him. And this goes back to that Ephesians passage. Be anchored in the Word and the truth. So repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And, here's the promise, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you want to know how to really take a stand, it's not about being in the presence of God, it's having the presence of God in you. And I can tell you where it's promised at. And when the Spirit of God possesses you, when it controls you, you do things that are far greater than anything you can do on your own. You have a greater level of peace, a greater level of joy. Because it's not based upon conditional things. If you want to learn more about the Holy Spirit, we did a series a couple years back just called Ghost. And it's, it's all about the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you to go online and check that out uh, via our website or on YouTube to learn a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to take you to a passage. This is in Colossians chapter 2, uh, page 984, starting with verse 6. Colossians 2, verse 6. Therefore... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. Established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Right? You can't just believe in God. It says in the book of James that even the demons believe and they shudder. Right? They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. However, they're just not willing to be obedient and submit themselves to the authority of of the Son of God. So we have to walk in Him. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The only way that we're going to or be able to spot and identify deception is to know the truth. Right? If you and I are anchored in the truth, we are going to be deceived time and time again by things that just aren't true, by things that are going to wreck us. So we have to know that and be able to take our stand. For in Him, Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled with Him. A couple of notes here. Jesus... Yes, he was a man made of flesh and bone like you and I. The full deity of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, dwelt inside of him. And the really cool thing is it's promised to all who believe that it will indwell us as well through the Holy Spirit. Let me read that to you again. It says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled with in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. God is the head of all rule and authority. Evil or not evil. Angels or demons or humans like you and I. God is the ultimate authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made without hands, or a circumcision made without hands, but by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, there's that word again. So we're cutting away all of the things that are not of God so that we can live more holy to God. Buried with Him in baptism in which we're raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God. We got a new life. 
is we. We get a chance to be the ghosts, right? We get a chance to die to everything that has messed us up and to have a new hope in Jesus Christ. We get a chance to be the ones called out of the grave. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Then He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. What did the cross do? Listen to this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Here's another way of saying that. When Jesus came down in the flesh, it disarmed the demons. They thought that maybe they were winning. They had a a chance because He's flesh. And then they got Him to the cross. Right? Beaten, abused, spit on and mocked, whipped and nailed to a cross. And in that moment, they thought that they won. But in that moment of death, when Jesus went there for you and I, He triumphed over all of the rulers and authorities. And He conquered sin and death. And in that, He makes us alive in Christ. You see, if you want to be able to get past all of the demonic activity, then you have to follow the One who has all authority over all of them. Right? And you have the, the promise of God, not just to dwell in the house and the protection of God, but to have the deity of God through the Holy Spirit indwelt into you. And it's a promise made through baptism. So some of you today, your, your next step is going to be this. That you're going to surrender. You're going to die to yourself so that you can be made alive in Christ. You're going to, to make that step today or someday in the future to enter into the waters of baptism so that you can receive the promise of God's Spirit living inside of you and giving you strength, power, comfort, conviction, all beyond what you ever thought or imagined. Some of you, some of you have already made that step. And you've been attending church, right? You've been wearing the right Christian clothing. But the reality is you're not anchored into the Word of God. You're not walking in Christ. And your next step is simply this. To get into and to live out the Word of God. Because if the Word of God is not in you, then the Spirit of God is not with you. Right? And you're giving a foothold to all of those evil things. And I think that we can do better than that. So what's your next step here today? I say we submit to God. Resist the devil. And let him flee from us.